Uh, Ray, would you like to uh, come and join me? Ray, thanks so much for coming and being with us today. Sure. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thanks for all you've uh, been teaching us. Uh, I'm going to pray for you uh, before you, you deliver our final talk. Heavenly Father, what a, a joy it is to be together with brothers singing your praises, uh, knowing that our life is hid with Christ on high. Uh, Father, what uh, joy, what confidence, what comfort that brings us. Father, as we turn to your word again now, would you feed us again? Would you give Ray the words to speak, explaining your word? Um, help us to see uh, more about how we can be men of prayer, particularly now as we depend on you uh, in the mission that you've given us. Uh, Father, encourage us in this, we pray, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Testing, te oh, that sounds better. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you've got Timothy open in front of you, I'm going to read some verses from 1 uh, uh, Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 15. Um, words that we will be familiar with, no doubt, but let's hear them again. Let's hear the word of God. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worse. And then verse 1 of chapter 2, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Because there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Well, we've all had a bit of a roller coaster ride over the last few years, haven't we? The last two or three years. Do you remember when the news dominating the headlines was whether or not you voted to leave or remain in the EU? Remember that? And then, still reading from the issues related to Brexit, we were hit with the COVID 19 pandemic. In January 2020, I had never heard of Zoom, and I'm not sure I even knew what a pandemic was, if I'm honest. Fevers, persistent coughs, and the phrase, you're on mute, became all the rage. You remember it? You remember those days? And then things moved on to whether or not you were an anti-vaxxer. Then there was Partygate and the suffering of the people of the Ukraine. Uh, more recently, I had to go away and check when someone pointed out that we have had four chancellors in as many months. But brothers, look on the bright side, only one more prime minister until Christmas. <laughs> That's a bad joke, but you laughed. <laughs> more seriously, our world is a very needy place, isn't it? For example, the need among Christians for greater resilience in an increasingly secular UK culture where political, political correctness means we are no longer free to speak biblical truth, truth that was taken for granted as recently as 20 years ago. Like a man is a man and a woman is a woman. The need for purity in a world increasingly confused around issues of marriage, sexuality and gender. The need for rigorous, disciplined, biblical thinking on a whole range of increasingly complex issues like abortion, assisted suicide, identity politics, the environment, sexism, racism, and the list goes on and on and on. Then, of course, there is the desperate need, as we were talking about this morning, for evangelism in a world full of those without Christ and therefore without hope and on a collision course with the judgment seat of Almighty God. Yet the one thing that would help address all these issues and more 
is perhaps our most urgent need of all, which I want to suggest to you is a deeper knowledge of God. Uh, True and sound wisdom consists of two parts, writes the great 15th century theologian John Calvin. What are those two parts? Well, first, the knowledge of God, and second, the knowledge of oneself. A more modern author writes, there is nothing more crucial than what we believe about God. And basic, foundational, and fundamental to a deeper knowledge of God is a spiritually persistent, biblically-minded prayerfulness. Prayer is a window into a person's inner being like nothing else can be. Such that whether we pray, for whom we pray, and what we pray says a lot about our character. That is the person who you are when no one else is looking. The actor Ralph Fiennes, I love watching movies, and the the actor Ralph Fiennes in a film I watched a few months ago uh, made this interesting observation. He said this, reputation is what people think of you. Character is what you are. Reputation is what people think of you. Character is what you are. Dare I ask, which of these are you most invested in as you sit here this afternoon in Nottingham in 2022, November? Surely focusing first and foremost on your character will mean your reputation will take care of itself. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encourages us to pray in secret because prayer speaks very much into our character. That is what we are as men when all is said and done. Brothers, can I ask you, how are you doing on the character front? How are you doing on the character front? Born in Edinburgh in 1813, it was said of the Scottish minister of the gospel, Robert Murray McShane, that it was not the words he spoke but the holy manner in which he spoke that was the chief means of arresting souls. Uh, McShane uh, once wrote these sober and challenging words, what a man is alone on his knees before God, that he is, and no more. Prayer may do little for your reputation amongst your fans, F-A-N-S, that is your friends, acquaintances, neighbors and strangers, but it speaks deeply of your character before Almighty God. Now, having said all this, I need to tell you right off the bat that even though I am a minister of the gospel who has been paid full-time for no more than two decades now to give himself to prayer and the ministry of the word, I BS you not when I tell you that I'm a rubbish prayer. So trust me when I tell you, I'm not here to help you feel even more guilty about your lack of prayerfulness than you already do. In fact, in his excellent little book, Why We Pray, William Philip makes this helpful observation. The truth is that all of us need to pray more. But if we start focusing on that, we'll lose our confidence in prayer. So, brothers, don't beat yourself up. And yet, we all, myself included, need to hear these, again, very helpful words of the great theologian, writer, and preacher, Professor Donald Carson, when he writes this. After all the difficulties have been duly recognized and all the dangers of illegalism properly acknowledged, the fact remains that unless we plan to pray, we will not pray. It is better to pray often with brevity than rarely but at length. But the worst option is simply not to pray. So the first thing I want to say about prayer as we close our conference this afternoon is this. A deeper knowledge of God will help you to pray, brothers. Don't focus on how much you do or don't pray. Focus on this. A deeper knowledge of God will help you to pray. If it is true that we learn most about prayer by learning about God, if a deeper knowledge of God is what will help us to pray, will encourage our prayer lives, then what is it that we learn about God from 1 Timothy that will help us? Well, I touched on this in my first talk. Nevertheless, let me remind you, uh, while probing a little further and a little deeper, 
God, our Savior, is concerned that all people everywhere come to a saving knowledge or understanding of the fact that he alone is the one true and living God. You can't say that enough. I make no apologies for repeating myself. There is one God who alone is a fiercely jealous God. And therefore, who in a settled, steady, unrelenting, antagonistic fashion will ultimately not tolerate all people worshipping other gods. His holy character simply will not allow this to go on indefinitely. As a result, he sent into this world the one and only mediator, qualified to bridge the gap, the divide between all peoples of this world, rebellious though they be, and himself. He sent the man, Christ Jesus. Elsewhere, Paul writes, Jesus Christ, instead of Christ Jesus, in order to emphasize the humanity of Jesus and the suffering he endured on our behalf, yours and mine. In God the Father's perfect timing, God the Son, the man Christ Jesus, gave himself as the ransom price for all people. At 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 puts it this way, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, verse 2. And behind this word ransom used here in 1 Timothy is the Old Testament idea of redemption. In the words of uh, another writer, the concept of redemption carries with it the idea of setting someone free from captivity or slavery. And typically, a price had to be paid. In our case, yours and mine, it was from our slavery to sin, death, and judgment. And to secure our rescue, that ransom price that was paid was the life of Jesus Christ poured out unto death. And these truths are what Paul describes in chapter 1, verse 11 of Timothy as the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. See that? Chapter 1, verse 11. It is summed up in Paul's own personal experience using the words of chapter 1, verse 15. Look at them. Here is the, a trustworthy saying, or more literally, a faithful word. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I, Paul, am the worst. Paul was a living, breathing trophy of this trustworthy or faithful word. Uh, the sense of chapter 1, verse 12, is that he did not deserve to be an apostle. Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. I thank God, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though, even though. It's a fact which he states plainly in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. You see, in his previous life, he persecuted and murdered Christians. According to his own words in chapter 1, verse 13 of 1 Timothy, he was a blasphemer and a violent man who acted in ignorance and unbelief. He was the worst of sinners, verse 15. First in line, in a lineup. And yet... This glorious gospel of the one and only blessed God turned Paul's life right around and upside down as he experienced God's immense patience and undeserved mercy. When you understand all this background, you can begin to feel the urgency behind Paul's words to Timothy in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Look at them with me. As I urge you, Timothy, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. 
Now, brothers, as uh, controversial or as unpalatable as we, uh, as we or others may find 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, we cannot evade the fact that leadership in the church of Jesus Christ resides with suitably qualified men as opposed to suitably qualified women. Uh, despite recent concerns and challenges surrounding the culture of church leadership and abuses of power, the church needs good, strong male leadership. Leadership that will not get distracted and will guard the gospel by preaching it clearly and faithfully. We do not need ministers who are constantly distracted and distracting. You know the kind of minister? He's always riding one hobby horse or another. And sadly, instead of using God's word to show all people their sin and need of the gospel, chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, the male elders or leaders in the house churches of Ephesus had become distracted by literally different teachings. What is translated as false doctrine in chapter 1, verse 3. They were indulging in speculations probably centered around myths connected with Old Testament genealogies. And this was causing needless controversy, leading to divisions and a sectarian spirit within the churches. No doubt the churches were being emptied. And the fact that God was and is a saving God, chapter 2, verse 3, was being pushed to the suburbs of church life. But trustworthy saying that it is the gospel that brings salvation to all people no longer occupied the city center of church life in Ephesus. Now, let me ask you this. Are you beginning to sense, to get some sense of the knowledge of who God is? That wasn't rhetorical. Are you beginning to get a sense of the knowledge of who God is? He is a God who is concerned for all people. And if you doubt that, look back 2,000 years ago to the cross of Jesus Christ as he hung there for you and for me. Can you sense Paul's urgent concern and therefore can you begin to sense what you as a Christian man should be concerned about? And frankly, it makes no difference whether you're an elder, presbyter, deacon, Warden or a layperson in your church or not? Well, let me suggest some things we could be praying based upon what we have seen in 1 Timothy. First, pray for your minister and his fellow elders. In short, brothers, pray for your church leaders. Whatever you call them, pray for your church leaders. That's the first thing. Pray for your church leaders. See, if in 1 Timothy, Paul is particularly concerned about the churches in Ephesus, in 2 Timothy, he is most concerned about his friend, Timothy himself. But yet, even in 1 Timothy, you sense Paul's concern for Timothy personally. And not, by the way, because Timothy was some kind of weakling or some timid wallflower, as he's often portrayed, but rather because he was given the very difficult job of standing up to fellow leaders within the church who were going astray. I can think of few things harder in church life. Paul must have thought Timothy was up to the job. Some of us here wouldn't be. Yet, were some tempted to look down on Timothy because of his relatively young age, chapter 4, verse 12? Did the understandable stress of a situation he found himself in make Timothy ill? Chapter 5, verse 23. Notice in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul describes what Timothy is engaged in as a battle. In my experience, keeping a concern for the gospel front and center in the local church is always a battle. If you don't think that, then either you are a very, very young Christian, super naive about church leadership and church life, or perhaps both. I imagine Timothy had days where he simply did not want to join the battle. Lord, can I just stay in bed today, please? 
but Paul urges him to hold on to his faith and a good conscience. Please, please notice that others had already abandoned these things and shipwrecked their faith. And no doubt any ministry they once had, namely Hymenaeus and Alexander. Chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. See that? Look at them. Holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Some years ago, I remember thinking, wow, when a really well-read, theologically savvy friend of mine, whom I looked up to, told me that a book written by this particular man was one of the best books on the topic of living the Christian life that he had ever read. After announcing in July 2019 that he was divorcing his wife, this former evangelical Christian minister who wrote this best-selling book and was a best-selling author shocked the evangelical Christian world when he wrote these words on his Instagram post. By all the measurements that I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. This man who authored this book that my friend read and, and recommended his deconversion experience, as some are calling it, has been deeply hurtful to many. My prayer is that in time he would return to the household of faith, thus demonstrating that he truly belonged to it in the first place. Brothers, whatever title or name they go by, pray for your church leaders. Pray that they would guard the gospel by making sure it is preached faithfully, whether directly or indirectly, in your church. Pray that they would continue to have pure hearts, a good conscience, and a sincere faith in Christ Jesus, for your sakes as well as theirs. Pray that they would not shipwreck their faith or anyone else's. Pray for their progress, that they might be enabled to persevere in keeping watch over both their lives and what they believe. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. And can I inquire... Are you even praying these things for yourself as the leader in your own home if you are married and perhaps have children who need your leadership in the home? Now, I don't want you to feel guilty, brothers, if you've not been regularly praying for your church leaders, but can you at least see why you need to be praying for them? Can you see why you need to be? It's not a matter of, well, we good, might be good, could, could not. Why you need to be praying for them. They're on the front line of the battle and directly in Satan's firing line. And we need young, enthusiastic, vibrant Christian men to enter full-time paid Christian ministry. And yet, do you notice chapter 3, verse 6? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Are you praying for the young men in your church who are aspiring to be in full-time ministry? They need your prayers. Back in 1872, the famous Charles Spurgeon preached the opening sermon at the church where I'm now the senior minister. Spurgeon was a minister of the 5,000-seater Metropolitan Tabernacle in southeast London, not far from where I used to live. Apparently, even though there was no sound system, his voice could be heard by one and all in that big auditorium. Well, after showing a group of young ministers his church building, Spurgeon insisted on showing them what he called his boiler room. And so he led them down into the basement where they apparently found about 100 people in prayer. Whenever he was asked the secret of his ministry, Spurgeon always replied, my people pray for me. Can I ask you, are you praying for your church leaders, brothers? Wouldn't it be great if every church represented here today had a boiler room full of men like yourselves praying for your church leaders? So first, pray for your church leaders, brothers. They need it. It's not just that it would be nice. I need it, we need it, they need it. But second, pray for your political leaders. All joking aside, brothers, pray for your political leaders. Now, it's none of my business whether you voted to leave or remain in the EU. 
much less whether you feel your decision has been vindicated or not since the vote back in April, just rather June 2016. I don't know whether you are happy or not with the way our government handled the pandemic. Perhaps you have very strong views on the recent Partygate scandal, our government stance on the war in Ukraine, or whether Liz Truss should still be our Prime Minister or not. My brothers, I don't mention these things to cause controversy or division among us, but rather because they are the sorts of issues that can and do cause divisions and controversies in our churches if we let them. The result being we get distracted from praying for our political leaders. Yet if we share the same gospel concern of God our Savior and Jesus our mediator, as well as the Apostle Paul, we will recognize that our political leaders need our prayers as much as anyone else. Being the Prime Minister of the UK is a tough job. I think all Christians should abide by the following principle. I will only criticize my political leaders in direct proportion to how much time I spend praying for them. I'm guessing that would help to temper some of our self-righteous indignation, criticism, and judgmentalism. You see, I think a kind of sectarian spirit existed in the churches in Ephesus, which meant prayer for the king or those in authority had been neglected or overlooked. And this is what stands behind chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanks even be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority. Notice if you look closely at verse 1 and 2, that Paul includes in the all people individuals like our prime minister and those who make up his cabinet and even King Charles III whether he's going to be defender of the faith or the faiths. You see, you and I are not at liberty to discriminate against them because they went to Eton, are overly privileged, or have an overt sense of entitlement. They still need the gospel and therefore our prayers that they see themselves as sinners in need of a saviour. Our desire, my desire, your desire, should be that our prime minister be a devoted Christian rather than a devoted Hindu. And just after Easter this year, and through an initiative by an organization called Christian Concern, I was encouraged to commit to praying for my local MP once a week until Pentecost or June 5th. Christian Concern also helped me to send her a postcard to let her know I was praying for her. This was not only a great initiative, but a biblical one. Brothers, pray for your political leaders. I don't know if you know that this, but there, uh, there is a group of Christians based in Westminster who are part of an all-party parliamentary group, or the APPG, that exists to support all members and staff in their work in the Houses of Parliament. Do you know that? And they do this through a number of different means, Bible studies and prayer groups, speaker events and discussion groups examining the truth and the relevance of the Christian faith to personal and particular political life, policy discussions and briefings informed by the Bible and Christian theology, and organizing the National Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast. You can go onto the APPG website and read or listen to the members of this group of MPs explain how they became Christians. These wonderful men and women need our prayers. Some of them may be in your churches. Brothers, pray for your political leaders. Pray that they will make wise decisions for the good of their constituents. And that they will be able to cope with the stresses and strains of public life. Pray for the work of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. That good and just decisions will be made and that the tone of debate is measured and constructive. Pray for Christian MPs, peers, and staff that their faith will grow and that they will seek to serve God and not their own interests, being salt and light in Parliament. Pray that all Christians working in Parliament will model disagreeing well and be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get 
angry. So we've seen that the God of the Bible is concerned for all people to come to a knowledge of a truth about who he is and how the leaders of the churches in Ephesus had lost sight of this. This led us to the conclusion that we need to be men who first pray for our church leaders. Secondly, that we need to be men who pray for our political leaders. But third and last, as we close out, we need to pray for the gospel to reach all people everywhere. Pray that the gospel reaches all people everywhere. We noted that the passage I looked at in our first session this morning, 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 to 8, both begins verse 1 and ends verse 8 in prayer. But I pointed out that the focus was not so much on prayer as the need for all people to come to a saving knowledge of the truth about the one God who has revealed himself through his one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. In the words of one commentator, this paragraph is not primarily concerned with prayer, rather it stresses the universal offer of the gospel, the universal offer of salvation. And Paul uses four words to describe this prayer in verse 1. Petition, prayers, intercession, and of course, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving apparently is a form of prayer. Who knew it? One Bible commentator makes a point that often the distinction between these four words are usually over subtle. That is because Paul is not trying to define the different types of prayer here. His point is more that the task of world evangelization, as I said this morning, is such a massive one that God's people need to be praying all sorts of prayer because there are all sorts of people both at home and abroad that need our prayers. The gospel was powerful enough to convert a man like Paul, who was highly educated. If you read the book of Acts, you will see it was powerful enough to convert many of the people of many of the city, many of the people in the city of Ephesus, who practiced and were heavily invested in paganism, sorcery, or witchcraft. And if you are at all invested in sharing your Christian faith with those who don't know Jesus you will know that you can't convert anyone. Which is why you and I need to pray that God our Savior, through his Holy Spirit, would unstop deaf ears, soften hard hearts, and cause blind eyes to see. The 18th century British parliamentarian, William Wilberforce, was a close friend of William Pitt, one of the great prime ministers of England. Wilberforce believed that if he could just get Pitt to to a service where he might hear a preacher named Richard Cecil, surely he would turn to Jesus and be saved. After months and months of invitations, Pitt finally agreed to hear Cecil preach. And true to form, Richard Cecil preached the good news of Jesus clearly and reverently. Wilberforce was ecstatic, sure that Pitt, a brilliant man, would fully grasp the central message of the gospel as Cecil had preached it. Yet, as soon as the two men, the two friends, emerge from the building, Pitt turned to Wilberforce and said, I did not understand the word of what that man was talking about. Now, William Pitt became prime minister when he was 24 years of age. He was a great man and arguably one of the greatest ever British prime ministers. Yet he failed to grasp the simple message of the gospel. And why? Well, because God the Holy Spirit did not unstop his ears, soften his heart, or opened his blind eyes to see. It is within the gift of God the Holy Spirit and he alone to convert people. That is not your job. You couldn't do it even if it were. It's not within my gift or yours. It is vital that we are clear about this, brothers, which is why we must petition, pray, intercede on people's behalf and give thanks to God when he converts them. We must ask God to have mercy on them. Brothers, are there people in your orbit or sphere of influence 
that you need to be praying for. Put it this way. Are you letting your fans down? You know you've got fans? You letting them down? By fans, I mean friends or family. Acquaintances. People who aren't really friends, but you see them often, maybe at work. Neighbors. We all have those, don't we? Neighbors. And maybe even strangers you bump into every now and again. Are you letting them down? People who you should be praying for, but the worries and distractions of working life, family life, and dare I say even church life, are distracting you from expressing your prayerful gospel concern for them. Well, may the Lord give us his grace and his help for it not to be so. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes and reflect upon what we've heard.